Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. I began talking along this topic on Wednesday night, and so I'm going to go over a couple different things. And, um, you know, there's no situation that's impossible. You know, sometimes when we're in the midst of something, it's hard to see. You know, like, like they say, it's hard to see the, the forest because of the trees. And when you're the one that's in the midst of the situation, lots of times you become very much tunnel vision. And you really can't see the way out. You can't see the way to go. Uh, seemingly, you can get to a place where it just like this is never going to change. Well, it is going to change in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's going to come to pass. Say it comes to pass. It didn't come to stay. It shall come to pass. Amen. So we began in Isaiah, the 38th chapter. It says, in those days, this is the first verse, was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now that's not a very good word, is it? You know, Isaiah was a prophet. That means that he came on the behalf of the Lord, the Lord God, and told him, Get your, get your house in order, you're going to die. That wasn't much of a comforting word, would you think? Uh, not really edifying. But now notice, look at what he said. Then Hezekiah, he turned his face toward the wall, and he prayed unto the Lord. And he said, Remember me now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. So now notice what he did when he got this report. Say, when he got this report. That's not a good report. That was a bad report. When he got this report, what did he do? He turned his face to the wall. He turned his heart to God. We could say it that way. He turned away from the situation. He turned away from the, from, from the, uh, from the report that he had just been giving about dying. And he turned his face to God, turned his heart towards God. Isn't that right? Now notice he said this. He said, I have, kept, I have walked before you in faithfulness and in truth. And this is the Amplified. With a whole heart absolutely devoted to you and, done what, what, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. You know, in one sense, he had some standing grounds. Amen. You know, God is always looking at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God, he is always looking at our hearts. That's why the word of God is so, uh, so specific about guarding our heart. He said you have to guard your heart with all diligence. That means you got to stay on it. That means it needs to come, become priority to you. What are you going to allow in your heart? Jesus even talked about it wasn't what a man that took him physically into his stomach that defiled him, but it was what comes out of his heart that defiles man. And so we have to understand God is always looking at the heart. We talked about how God told Samuel to go down to Jesse's house and to anoint one of his sons to be king. And of course, he shows up on the scene and, 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 and he has the sons of Jesse come forward and they come by him. And here's, here's the prophet thinking, surely that's God's anointed one. And God would say, no, he's not the one. And he went down the line, surely look at his outward appearance. And God would say, no, he's not the one. He went through seemingly all of his sons, and he said, do you have any more sons? Because God has rejected all these. And he said, well, I have a son, David, he's out tending sheep. He said, well, go call him immediately. Let's get him here. Isn't it interesting that his dad <laughs> didn't, even have, didn't even have David come when he said to call for all his sons because God wanted to anoint one of his sons. That tells me that in his, that is in his, in his father's eyes, he didn't look at him with that, kind of, uh, with that kind of perception that God would actually anoint him to be king. Isn't that right? I mean, and then God said, I, man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. So there was obviously something about David's heart, and the Bible tells us later on that David had a heart after God. Man, if you have a heart after God, I'm telling you what, things can change in your life overnight. Amen. Amen. God is always looking after our heart. Are we seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, or are we seeking all the things that we went added onto us? Amen. Mark 9, the 16th chapter, or 9, 9 the 16th verse. And it says, And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. 
And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and he gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I speak to those disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it's cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You know, I always like to point this out. I, do this, I try to do this often because lots of times we read, we read what the Word of God says and we read these actual, these are actual accounts of things that actually took place. We don't, well, th these are not fables, amen? These are real life happenings. People live in life. How would you like to have a child that a devil had possessed to the degree that that spirit would try to take control of that child and cast him in the water so that he would drown or throw him into a burning fire? I mean, I can only imagine as a parent how that would just grip your heart and how it would hurt your heart and then to come to realize that there's nothing that you personally can do about it. There's nothing you can change it. He obviously knew he had a spirit, but he knew he did not have the authority to cast him out. But he must have heard about this man named Jesus. Right. Amen. And he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you're willing, you can do this. Now notice what Jesus said. He said, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him. Now notice what Jesus did. He said, if you can believe... All things are possible to him that believeth. Now notice what he did. It wasn't a point, it, 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 it had nothing to do. Jesus, it wasn't Jesus saying, it's up to me. It was Jesus saying, it's up to you. It's up to you. The end results are up to you. Can you believe? Can you believe that I can do this? Can you believe that I will do this? You see, this is the bottom line. Lots of times people, I mean, you can ask anybody that believes in God, and you could ask them, could God do this? Right? I mean, anything. Could, could God turn this situation around? And people are thinking, well, yes, he can because he's God and God can do anything. But really the bottom line is, is will God? Say, will God? Will God do this? Will God turn this situation around? And so Jesus is saying, listen, it's possible. All things are possible to them that believe. And this man cried out and he said, Lord, he cried out in tears. Say in tears. Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he is as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. I like what the Weymouth translation says about the 21st verse. Immediately the father cried out, I do believe, strengthen my weak faith. Now, we have to talk about this just for a moment as we go on. But you have to realize there are different degrees of faith. Right? When you look at the, when you look at the Gospels where Jesus was talking, there were times he would say, great faith. Other times he just, he just rebuked these people and said, you're a faithless generation. And then he talked about another man we'll probably talk about here in a little bit. And he said, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. So there are different places or different levels of belief. Or we could say believing in God, right? Let's go here a little bit further. In John, the 11th chapter, the first verse. It says, now there was a man who was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he, him whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. I think it's kind of interesting that they sent to Jesus and said, Jesus, Lazarus, whom you love is sick. What were they saying? Come, Jesus. You love them. And then it says here that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and he loved Lazarus. So there was some sort of relationship with them. Well, don't you believe that Jesus loves you? Yeah. I mean, you know, little kids in Sunday school used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. 
For the Bible tells me so. And it's, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Well, Jesus, is a, uh, Jesus loves everybody. God loves everybody. God does not, there's, there's, there's not one person that God hates. God loves the world. God loves everybody. The 15th, or the 6th verse says this, When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, what, what, what we would want to do is, man, we better get there now. We better, we better hightail it to where Lazarus is. And that would be the expectation. Wouldn't that be your expectation if you were Mary or Martha and you sent for Jesus and said, have Jesus come at once because Lazarus is sick unto death? And here Jesus says, well, you know what? I got the report, but we're going to stay here a couple days more. Why would he do that? I believe, based on what he said in the Word, that he didn't go anywhere unless the Father told him to go. And he didn't say anything unless the Father told him to say it. I believe, I believe that, he, that he was perfectly following God's plan in this situation. Then after he saith to his disciples, let us go unto Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late have sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walks in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. These things he said, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleeps, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent that you may believe, nevertheless let us go unto him. The 16th verse says this, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. That's kind of whacked, isn't it? Lazarus is, Lazarus is dead, and let's go with Jesus so that we can die too. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that would have been my response. But <laughs> then, when, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of his Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord... If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou shalt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Man, that's pretty bold, isn't it? Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But I know now that you're here. Mm. Glory to God. It's never too late. It's not over until it's over. You know, they say it's not over till the fat lady sings. It's, it's, it's not even over when she sings. Amen. It's not over until it's over. Oh, glory to God. Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never lie, shall never die. Believest now this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which would come into the world. Man, I like that. She knew who he was. She knew he was the Son of God, and she knew he was the Christ. Do you know what Christ really means? It's not a last name. It's a description. The anointed one. The holy and anointed one. We could say it this way, the anointed one and the anointing. Mm. She knew he was the resurrection. And when she had said so, 28th verse, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master has come and calls for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, 
If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Here we're seeing it again by the other sister. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. We used to say this. Kids back in Air Force, their favorite verse is this one right here. For memory verse. Jesus wept. See, Jesus was, Jesus was touched by all this that was going on too. He, he, he felt the grief and the, and, and the sorrow that Martha and Mary were experiencing. I mean, he loved them after all, right? right. When, let's go here. And some of them said, then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave, and it was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. And he saith, this is the 40th verse, and he saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou would believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Let me say that again. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou would believe, would do what? Thou shalt see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus looked up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with napkins. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. Notice he put it back or didn't I tell you that if you would only believe that you would see the glory of God. Doesn't it seem like when you really need to see the glory of God or we could say the manifest presence of God or we could say God's promise is manifested or whatever it is that we have need of, isn't that really the time where it seemingly seems like things come against you trying to attack what you really believe? You see, it's easy to say that you believe some things when everything is going fine in life. Amen? It's easy to say God is good when you have no issues. It's easy to say that God supplies all your needs when you don't have any needs that you're facing. It's easy to say Jesus is the healer when there's no symptoms in your body. Amen? Well, that's a, that's a level of believing, but that level of believing is a lower level because you're believing based on where you find yourself in the situation. But really, faith is when you believe God when everything is contrary to what He said in His Word. Let's go here a little bit further. The Amplified in the 40th verse says it this way. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you and promise you that if you would believe and rely on me, you would see the glory of God? The CEV or the Contemporary English says it this way. Didn't I tell you that if you had faith, you would see the glory of God? You see, so much, so much of life is, uh, you know, people, people think, well, I gave my heart to Jesus. Now shouldn't everything just be perfect? I mean, shouldn't I have a perfect marriage and perfect kids and perfect job and perfect health and perfect peace? And shouldn't everything just be perfect now? I gave my heart to Jesus. A lot of people, you know, just like when Jesus was in the ship asleep and a storm came, they came down and they asked Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? You know, they were wondering, Jesus, don't you even care that we're going to die? And we can get like that where we feel like Jesus doesn't care, but he's always turning it around on us. Believe me. Trust me. Put your confidence in me. Hold fast. Don't let go. Amen. Mark 11, of course, many of you know this verse. Mark 11, 22. Let me set this up. Jesus had been, they'd been going into town the day before, and they came up on this fig tree. Jesus was hungry, wanted something to eat. He looked at the fig tree and it wasn't producing any fruit. So he cursed the tree. Say he cursed the tree. Now how, do you, how, how did Jesus curse the tree? You know, a lot of people think you do incantations and you, know, you, you, you use different incense and, and, and you know, we have all these different things. But Jesus cursed the tree and all he did is he spoke to the tree. I said he spoke to the tree. What did he say? Never bear fruit again. I curse you. Well, the next day they're coming back, 
And the, the, the disciples look at the tree and they bring it to Jesus' attention. They said, Jesus, the tree that you cursed, it's dead. It's withered up at the roots. Man, there is such power in what we say. People think, well, that was just Jesus. Jesus spoke that. No, we're going to see here in a minute. He tells us what to do based on what he just did. Do you remember when Jesus, after he was led into the wilderness for 40 days, he overcame the temptation of the devil. He came unto, unto Peter, Peter's house. Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a, with, with a fever. And he went in and the Bible says he rebuked the fever. Yeah. Well, how do you rebuke something? With your mouth, you got to say something to it. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Fever, you break. Fever, you loose. You know, years ago, before Mary and I were Christians, um, I was raised in a, in, a, in, a, in a godly home, raised in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a home where you went to church every Sunday. No if, what's, or buts. There was, I mean, there was no, I, I probably would have had to been in the hospital to not have to go to church. And, um, I mean, if I spent the night at a friend's house, I had to come home and go to church. Think of that. I'm thank God for it. I said, I thank God for it. My mom put some things in me about being faithful to the things of God. And so Mary and I weren't saved yet. But I, remember, uh, I remember our son Joseph was just a little baby, and uh, he had a fever. And, of course, my mom, naturally what her, her, her first go-to is pray. Mary, Mary and I aren't saved. It's give them liquid Tylenol or something. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, as, as a parent, especially your first child, they got a fever. I mean, that's kind of, that's con more concerning. Isn't it funny as you have another child, it's like, ah, no big deal. I mean, I remember, I remember, you know, you'd, you'd go to the restaurant and Mary would have like a washcloth and a, and a plastic bag. And then after a while, she says, well, just wipe their mouth with a napkin and everything's going to be all right. You know, it's, <laughs> you kind of, you, you kind of loosen up a little bit. It's going to be all right. You know, after, after that, after that first one is, is born. And so I remember my mom, my mom said, well, I'm going to pray for him. And she rebuked the fever and the fever instantly left. Here, Mary and I were heathens. We're like, whoa. <laughs> well, she rebuked the fever. See, these aren't just things that Jesus did. These are things that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to open my mouth. Say, open my mouth. And speak to these things. So Jesus, they, they pointed this out to Jesus. Now notice the 22nd verse. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Now that, that, that have faith in God, a lot of people say, well, I'm supposed to have faith in God. But really, if you would go and Greek that out, it means this, have the God kind of faith. Amen. You see, there is, there is natural faith. Amen? I have natural faith that if I step off this, this platform, that I'm going to go down. I know there's a, a, a law at work called gravity, right? I have natural faith that the sun is going to come out tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. The sun's going to come out tomorrow. Even if I don't see it, I know it came out. It's just that there's cloud cover. <laughs> Amen. I have, that's, that's a natural kind of faith. But God has a high octane kind of faith. Yeah. It's the God kind of faith. It's the same faith that God operates in. I'll point something out here in a minute. And Jesus answering, saying to them, have the God kind of faith. Well, what's the God kind of faith look like? For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he will have whatever he saith. So, here he is. He's talking, this is what the God kind of faith looks like. That you speak to the mountain. Whosoever shall think about the mountain. Whosoever shall tell everybody about the mountain in their life. See, he's not talking about the Rockies here or the Smokies. He's talking about obstacles, impossibilities, circumstances, mountains that stand in the way that are seemingly so big. Notice he said, cast them into the sea because the sea is the only container that would be great enough for a mountain to even fit in. So he's talking about, he's talking about a big deal here, a big situation. And he's saying, this is what you're supposed to do. He says, you're supposed to speak to the mountain. Mountain, be thou cast into the sea. Well, what was the God kind of faith about? Do you remember in Hebrews, the 11th chapter? It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by something that was not seen. Right? 
Well, what is something that is not seen that God used when he framed the worlds? Or when we could, we could say this, when he created the world, what did God use? God used words out of his mouth to frame the world, to create the world. Do you remember that? In the beginning, it talked about how there was no light. And God said, let there be light, and light was. Do you know what's interesting is light still is? And light is still traveling. It hasn't stopped since, since God said, let there be light. And there was light. He talked about dividing the, the, dividing the waters. I mean, he spoke all these things. When he spoke all these things, then it happened. He's trying to get that same kind of God kind of faith and understand for us to operate in it. Man, I have found, listen, I, I have found this in life. It is so easy to speak contrary to things in your life, to situations in your life. It's so easy to speak the problem and not the answer. It's so easy to talk about the problem. It's easy to even tell God all about your problems, but you really need to tell your problems all about God yeah. and all about Jesus and all about what God said in his word. He said, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things that he says shall come to pass, and he will have whatsoever he says. Have whatsoever he says. Have whatsoever he says. I've tried to help people different times along life, and very often, Brother Hagin used to say it this way, we need to do a checkup from the neck up. That's this place right here. A check up from the neck up. And very often it's because we're thinking wrong and we're speaking wrong. See, well, I'm just going to speak my mind. You know, sometimes you just ought to not speak your mind. Unless you have the mind of Christ. Amen. And so very often, very often, you know, you, you, just different people in different situations. Oh, I'm so tired. I'm always so tired. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I am so tired. Oh, I am so tired. Do you know they have scientific studies now that actually show that your mind, go, your brain actually causes different things to go to work at your body based on what your mouth says? Dr. Young E. Cho, many of you have heard about him. Had largest church in the world. North Korea, of all, or South Korea of all places. And, uh, you know, that's why some of these things are happening in North Korea. Because them South Koreans, I'm telling you, they have been a praying for years. And you know what's so cool is they're ready. Man, when them borders come down, they are going to be flying. I mean, they're going to be marching in there with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will happen. You mark my word, it's going to happen before Jesus comes back. And them people in North Korea are going to have the opportunity to hear the word of God and give their hearts to Jesus. And so he, was, he, he, he actually had a friend that was a brain, a, a brain surgeon and a scientist, and he, he had lunch with them, and, 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 and this man began to talk to Dr. Young E. Cho and began to tell him that we've got this, 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 uh, this, this, breaking, uh, this breaking technology now and this breaking scientific study, and he began to talk to him about what you say with your mouth causes your body to do different things, causes your brain, and it begins to stimulate the things. I mean, think of this. Come on, I mean, think, th think of this. And, 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 and Dr. Yong Yi Cho, of course, he's Chinese. He goes, oh, he said, I knew that. I've known that for a long time. And he said, oh, how do you know? This is breaking. This is breaking scientific study. He said, Dr. James told me about it. And he was talking about James, the book of James, because it talks about the exact, God's word is true. God's word is light years ahead of, 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 of what the world knows. There are answers in this word that we haven't even opened up and got the revelation about, but we're going to in these days in which we live. Glory to God. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now notice he said, when you pray, you believe. When you pray, you believe. When you pray, you believe, you receive. When you pray, you believe, you receive. When you pray, you believe, you receive. Not after you receive, you believe, you received. That's not faith. 
When you pray, you believe that you receive, and then you shall have them. When? Then. When's then? When you pray. What's that mean? I have them before I see them. I receive them before I see them. I said I receive them before I see them. Just to touch on this, just because it's the next verse. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have aught against any, that your Father, which is also in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Now, I pointed that out just for a moment there, because he's basically telling us, he's tying this in, he's putting it together, he's joining it together, because he said, and when you, and, and, and when you stand praying. Or we could say it this way, and when you stand saying. Right? You see, there's praying and there's saying. Praying, uh, uh, when you're speaking to the mountain, you're praying. He just tied it all together. And when you stand praying, forgive that your Father in heaven may also forgive you, which tells me your heart and having unforgiveness in your heart can hinder all the saying you want to do in the world to your mountain. Goes back to what I was talking about. God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. Let's look at Dr. James. James 1, the fifth, the fifth verse. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and that shall be given to him. Now, 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 now notice this part here. But, say but. but. What's he doing? He's putting a condition on this. He's putting a condition on when you go to God and you ask him, for wisdom. Anybody in here need wisdom? You know what? I'm, I, I'm so convinced that there's many times in life we need wisdom more than we need what we think we need. Amen. Well, I, I need a financial miracle. Very often we just need wisdom. Amen. Lord, I, I got to have a breakthrough. Lord, I, I, I need you to work in my marriage. I need, to, I need you to work in that relationship. And very often what you really need is wisdom. All the married folks said? Amen. Anybody, any married people in here ever did anything unwise? <laughs> said anything unwise? I mean, all, come on. All of us have. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. What's nothing? It means no wavering. No kind of wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What man is not supposed to think they're going to receive anything of the Lord? The double-minded man. Who's wavering? Amen? The Amplified says it this way in the 8th verse. If any of you is deficient in wisdom... Let him ask of God, ask of the giving God. Say the giving God. Man, I like that. That tells you his nature. He's not, he's not trying to withhold wisdom from you. He wants to give it to you. In fact, he said that he gives it liberally. That means lots. He gives you a bunch. He'll give you a bunch of wisdom. And he won't upbraid you. That means he's not going to reject you. That means he's not going to make you feel bad because you're coming to him for wisdom. As a matter of fact, really, we should be going to God first and His Word first. Amen? But because we're human, we like to wait until we're in a pickle. Amen? Wait till we're in a mess. And then, oh, Lord God, help! <laughs> I need help. Give me wisdom. Show me what to do. If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God. Say the giving God. Man, that's good to know. He's a giving God. He, he's not the withholding God. Amen. He's, a, he's the giving God. He wants, to, he wants to give and give and give and give and give. I mean, he already gave the greatest thing he could ever give. And that was Jesus and salvation through the blood of Jesus. The Bible says there's nothing that he will withhold from those who walk upright before him. 
There's the condition of the heart again. There's nothing. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, not only in the world which is, in to, co which is to come, but in this world. If you, being evil, know how to give good things unto your children, how much more does your heavenly Father want to give good things unto you? If any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault-finding, and it will be given him. Only it must be in faith that he asks, no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers and hesitates and doubts is like the billowing surge at sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly, not, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything that he asks for from the Lord. For being as he is, a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, and irre ir irresolute, he is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he thinks, feels, and decides. That word waver, it means this. It means to separate thoroughly, to oppose, to hesitate, to strive with, to dispute, and to contend with. Um, he said we're of two minds, double-minded man. Now let me just say this, because really when you step over into the place of faith, and we can school ourselves into faith, let me just, let me just touch on that. Because Romans 8, 17 tells us how, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we can school ourselves into faith. We can build our faith by feeding our spirits the word of God. We can build our faith, or let me say it this way. I, I use this verse with Emma, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. It doesn't say mind, right? It doesn't say emotions. It says trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own. In all your ways acknowledge and he shall direct your paths. So that tells me that faith is of the heart and not necessarily of the mind. See, this will help you. There's times where I have been in faith. I knew I had it. Didn't see it yet. I knew I had it, but my mind was giving me a fit. My mind was trying to tell me, trying to show me, trying to run videos. You know what I'm saying? With all the details and all the things that are going on, that's why you have to get your mind renewed with the Word of God so it thinks in line with the Word of God, so it thinks in line with the Spirit of God. And so you can, you can actually be in faith, but yet, but yet your mind can be giving you a fit. Do you remember David and Goliath? David and Goliath, I mean, he was in faith, but you can't tell me what his mind wasn't telling him something different. I mean, when you see a giant, tall dude, and he's out there, and he's challenging you and intimidating you, that's what the enemy does. The devil is always trying to intimidate you. He's going to intimidate you with, with thoughts of lack and intimidate you with thoughts of divorce and intimidate you with, with symptoms in your body, intimidate you with all kinds of different fears and, 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 and torments. He's always trying to intimidate you. But man, when you've got the spirit of faith, when you've got faith in God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean your mind isn't going to want to entertain these things. It's that you just know in your heart. Man, David, David knew. I said, he knew in his heart. You know, I believe he knew because he knew he had a covenant with God. You've got a covenant with God. He said this uncircumcised Philistine. Uncircumcised means that he doesn't have a covenant with God. But you have a covenant with God. You even have a covenant that's better than the covenant that David have a covenant. Your covenant is based on better promises, the Bible says. And your covenant has not been ratified with the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons. Your covenant has been ratified, signed, sealed, and delivered with the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and he is a covenant keeping God you know what a covenant really is a covenant when, when, when they cut covenant it meant this everything that is mine is yours I will protect you just like you are my own and when you make a covenant with God that's how worse people oh I love it God says that about me but how about this God Everything I have is yours. 
as Schaefer takes up the offering. I'll defend you, God, to the end. Till somebody says something <laughs> on Facebook and they persecute me and I unfriend them. <laughs> Covenant works both ways. How'd you get me off on all that? Now notice this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him give of God. Now the, 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 the King James puts in parentheses that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. So yearly, if, if we wanted to take those parentheses out, it would say this, if any of you let, lack wisdom, let him ask of God and it shall be given him. He was trying to, I think, encourage us. He's trying to encourage us that God wants to give this to us. He wants us to have this wisdom. Now notice, let's, let's, let, let's look at a double-minded man for just a second. Here's this double-minded man. He recognizes that he lacks wisdom. Well, that's a good place to start, isn't it? Lord, I lack, I, 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 I lack wisdom. So he looks to God and he says, God, I realize you have the wisdom that I need. You know, that's why when you look in the, in the Ephesians prayer, a very powerful prayer. In Ephesians 1, that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. I pray it for myself often. I pray it for this church often. That he would give unto us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I, you know, when, when we get to heaven, we are going to find out about attributes of God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the Word of things that haven't even entered into our minds. We haven't even, haven't even touched on them. So he sees that he has wisdom, so he approaches God and he asks for his wisdom. Yet, as he is asking, this is the double-minded man, he doesn't believe that God's going to give it to him. Uh, let me just help you here. The Bible says this, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. 1 John 5. This is the confidence that we have in God. Confidence. That's faith. That's trust. Right? This is the confidence that we have in God. That, now he qualifies it, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So, that tells me that when we go to God in prayer, first of all, we need to be ascertaining what is the will of God. See, a lot of people negate their praying by this very simple, religious-sounding prayer, and they add, if it be your will. Lord, I ask that you do this, if it be your will. Well, it, the Bible says, I just quoted it to you, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If anyone, or 7 and 8, I think, if anyone asks according to the will of God, we know that he hears us. So that tells me we could be we could pray a lot of prayers that God doesn't hear. Uh, let me say it more clearly. We can be praying a lot of prayers that God will not respond to because it's not His will. It is up to believers to find out what is God's will when we go to Him in prayer. That's why He said we have to know, God, that it is your will that, we give, that, that you give us wisdom. See, we know that God wants to give us wisdom based on what we just read in James, that he wants to give us wisdom. And so when, what you need to do, lots of times, is, 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 is we, uh, we, go to the, we go to the praying part too soon. The praying part too soon. Uh, I call it, I, I guess I would say it like this, is that what we really need to center in on is we need to get on praying ground. Praying ground. That means we need to have our foot on the rock of the truth. Because if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And then it goes on to say, and if he hears us. Well, he just said we can know that he hears us. And the way that we know that he heard our prayers is because we asked him according to his will. And if we know that he hears us, it goes on to say, then we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Man, I like that because, uh, uh, you know, you can, you, you, can, you can get around some people and you can, I mean, you can, actually, you can actually spend time praying with them and then you could ask them, well, did God hear you when you prayed today? And they would say something like, well, I hope so. 
You don't, listen, you can remove hope. The, the, the hope so part, don't, don't become hopeless. But you can, you can remove that statement about I hope so, and all you can, you can boldly say, I know so. I know that God heard me when I pray. How did I know? Because I know I asked him according to his will. Well, how did you know you asked him according to his will? Because I've got chapter and I've got verse and I've got book. Some of the greatest praying you can do is the word of God. I, 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 I stress this sometimes on, on Wednesday morning prayer because uh, it's, 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 it's lots of times um, we talk about God speaking to us. And we talk about God as a spirit, and we're led by the spirit. But this is, God, this is God speaking to you. This right here. Man, I never hear from God. Well, do you ever read your Bible? Do you ever open your Bible app? Huh? God never speaks to me. Do you ever, do you, do you ever get in the word of God and, and listen to what he has to say? I mean, this is God's, I think it was Joel Osteen used to say all the time, this is God speaking to me. I can have what it says I can have. I can be who it says I can be. Right here. See, God, God's speaking to us. This is logos, written word. But God has rhema, God-breathed word. And very often this God-breathed word, it is God breathing upon a scripture just for you. Do you remember what the psalmist said? He said, I have hidden thy word in my heart so that I won't sin against you, God. What did he do with that word? He took the word of God and he got it down in his heart. How do you get the word of God in your heart? I'm answering some questions for some folks today. How do you get the word of God in your heart? You get the word of God in your heart through your eyes, right? Uh, remember what he told Joshua, meditate in it, therein day and night, observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make the way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And you get it in your heart through your ear gate. How do you get, hey, while we're here, how do you get evil things in your heart? Same way. Through the eyes, through the ears. What was that song, honey? They sing in nursery. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above, He is looking down with love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above, he is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. I love that we just teach these little children simple Bible truths. So it's, 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 important, it's important how these, what we let come in, what we listen to, who we listen to, what we look at, Amen. What you watch on TV. Come on, what kind of music you're listening to. Oh, it ain't no big deal. The Bible says neither give entrance to the enemy. You, you open the door to him. Come on. I won't get, I won't get off on meddling, although I probably should. It says... So he approaches God, he asks for his wisdom, but as he's asking, he doesn't believe that God will give it to him. So my whole point was, how do we get ourselves into this position that God will give us what we are believing for, what we're asking him for? It comes by, once again, it comes by the word of God. And so I was talking about, there's the Logos word, which is a written word, and God's word is anointed. Brother Hagin used to tell us all the time, uh, when, when, when we were going to Bible school, he, he, he'd, he'd say this often. He'd say the word's always anointed. Amen. He said, when you come and you do a service, be open to the Spirit of God to move. But if the Spirit of God isn't moving in any, 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 certain, uh, any certain vein, he said the word of God is always anointed and it's always right to preach. Amen. And so here we have, this, we, 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 we have this, this logos and we have the rhema. And the rhema word is uh, the scripture... But yet, it's, 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 it's God-breathed, meaning it's God giving you a scripture. It comes out of your spirit. It doesn't come out of your mind. But it's, I, I just like to say it this way. It's rolling around on the inside of you. You know, this is very important, even with songs. 
Have you ever got up in the morning and you start singing a song? It's not like you thought about the song. It's not like you were listening to the radio. It's just a song. Very often, God is using those things, especially if it's a spiritual song, meaning if it was inspired by God. There's a lot of Christian music out there. I don't know who it was inspired by. but I don't think it was God. But, but, uh, but, but when it's inspired by God, it's kind of like it's, 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 it's working in you. The word that God speaks is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's talking about the pneuma, the God-breathed life. And so he will give you a scripture on the inside of you. What's he trying to do? Hey, anybody there? Hello? Can you hear me now? Put down your phone. What's he doing that for? It'll start working. What, what does he want you to do? He wants you to get, let it work. Yeah. Let the scripture work like yeast and dough. Begin to meditate on it. There's times this happened to me, I, I don't even know the chapter and verse. And I'll get out my concordance and I'll find it out. And I'll begin to get that word and I'll begin to look at that word. And I'll begin to meditate on that word and think on that word. And I'll read before it and I'll read after it. And I'll get my little cross-reference. Most Bibles have these little cross-references. And I'll find uh, other verses that it, that it shows you to go to in the concordance. And I will, I will look at those other verses and try to get it in context. You know, lots of times, not lots of, often, this is how I get messages to preach. I don't get, I don't get uh, you know, I don't belong to the Sermon of the Week Club. Uh, I, don't, I don't get sermons emailed to me. I try to get them from heaven. Right. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and there's times where he just begins to stir scripture into me. Like last, last Wednesday. And even last Sunday, there's no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. That just started to work in me. Started to work in me. I knew it was for me, but I knew it was for y'all too. Amen? So, so, so what, 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 does, what happens? Now think of this. What happens when those things begin to stir in you? You see, very often, you have to realize that those things are stirring in you because God has a purpose for it to be stirring in you. Otherwise, it would not be stirring in you. Don't just, don't just, you know, press it back down. Work, let, it, let it work in you. Talk about it. Meditate it. Speak it out loud. Uh, uh, quote it. Let, it let, let it come out of you. Because you know what's happening? There's something going on with that word. Yeah. It's pneuma. It's life. Jesus said the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. It's life. It's a life-giving word. It's working on the inside of you. And guess what's beginning to take place? As you begin to think on it and read it and put it before your eyes and speak it with your mouth, there's something that's taking place. You don't even realize it, but it's called F-A-I-T-H is rising up on the inside of you. You're feeding, you're, you're feeding your spirit. Brother Hagen used to say, I think it's a shame that we feed our bodies three square meals a day and our, our spirit a little snack on Sunday. You know, your, your, your spirit man, he's like Pac-Man. Remember Pac-Man? They still do Pac-Man? I remember the old-fashioned Pac-Man, you know, the stand-up machine or whatever, you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and Pac-Man's just like this. He's just, he's, I mean, your spirit man's hungry. Except those little things are whatever they're called. That's the word. Yum, 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 cha, 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 cha. Your, your, your spirit man is hungry. You, he, he, I said your spirit man is hungry. Your spirit man is hungry for the Word of God. How do they say that? Hungry. Hungry. Your spirit man is hungry for the Word of God. You know, sometimes, well, I, I really don't feel like he's hungry. You start feeding him. You start feeding him, and he'll want more. And he'll want more. And he'll want more. And he'll want more, but you got to feed him. I said, you got to feed him. He's not like that caged animal at the zoo. They say, do not feed. No, he, he wants to be fed the Word of God. So what will happen? I'm going to close here in just a minute. What will happen? Well, like I was saying, so, so, so then, then this faith begins to rise up. Then you begin to ask God, you know His will. You begin to ask Him according to His will. Amen? And then that faith is there. And then you come to a place where you believe that you receive when you pray. Man, I've had that happen. It's like nothing's changed. Doesn't look any different. Nothing looks different about my situation. But I know that I know that I know that I know. I not, not know here. 
not known by what I see or, or what I feel or what my senses can touch in the natural. I know that 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 I know. You can't pull it out of me with a John Deere tractor and a chain hook to it. Amen. Because I know that I know that I know that I know. I'm going to encourage you with this last thing before we go. Many of you have heard me say this before. But that's why it's so important. We do so much and get ourselves in messes. Say get ourselves in messes. It's not God. Not God putting us in a mess. Not going to take us through the fire. Take us through the fire. The kind of fire God takes you through is not to bring you into bondage, it's to bring you into liberty. The fire that will burn up the, 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 the wood, hay, and the stubble. Amen? It's, it's not God t t taking you through that trial. Amen? What's he trying to do? He's trying to, he's trying to get you to a place where you know that you know that you know. And what happens is, is, is we'll step out and we'll do things and we didn't know. Well, you know, I'm going to start my own Christian construction company and I'm going to, I'll put a fish, Christian fish symbol on my business cards. God, and they will say, God, you've got to bless it. Lord, you've got to bless it. Look at, I even got to, I've, I'm even witnessing for you. You've got to bless it. I know, it's, it's, it seems silly, but we do these things. We do these in, in different areas, right? We, we do things not knowing that it was God's will that we do it. And then when we get in the mess, and listen, anytime you do, <laughs> we, even when you do the right thing and you've heard from God, doesn't mean that there isn't going to come temptation <laughs> and come resistance to walking in the plan of God. Just because you're walking it out doesn't mean that the, the red carpet rolls out and the crowds part and you just walk through the midst. Amen. Very often, the closer you are and the more on track you are to the plan of God, the more the resistance of the enemy wants to come and get you off track, get you to quit, get you to turn around, get you to stop, get you to do anything. But don't do what God wants you to do. And so it's important that, 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 that just like James says in, in James, uh, he talks about here, he said, about people that we're going to go into town, we're going to buy and we're going to sell and we're going to make gain. He said, don't you say that. He said, you ought to say, if it be the will of God, we're going to go into that town, we're going to buy and sell and make, and, and make profit. So what was he talking about? No, you find, out, you find out the will of God. When you walk in the will of God, it's blessed. It's blessed already. Amen. God's plan is blessed. 